Okay, uh, let's come to the first topic, manifestations of systemic diseases and conditions. Well, this paper is actually a great source of information. The authors, the experts, did a fantastic job of gathering all the information that is available, screening the literature worldwide. And you have to realize some of these entities are very rare. So there are only case reports, few case reports available. And it's all in this paper, so we need this information. And if you have such a patient, you can go into this paper and get the info you need. In the group, in the working group, we phrased a few critical questions and then we developed the answers. And I will share with you some of those questions and also, of course, the answers. Number one, is it possible to categorize systemic diseases and conditions based on the underlying mechanism of the effect on the periodontal supporting tissues? In other words, how do they affect the periodontal tissues in a negative way? Number two, which diseases and conditions can affect the periodontal supporting tissues? And number three, should diabetes-associated periodontitis be a distinct clinical diagnosis? And finally, another important one, uh, should nicotine or smoking-associated periodontitis be recognized as a distinct diagnosis? Well, and these are the answers. Number one in terms of the underlying mechanisms and the way to organize all these many, many rare, sometimes very rare entities? Well, the answer would be uh, yes, there are genetic disorders that affect the host immune response or the connective tissues. There are metabolic and endocrine disorders and there are inflammatory conditions. In the future, there will be a further refinement of these categories but right now, these are the major ones that have to be recognized. Okay, the next question. Which diseases and conditions can affect actually the periodontal supporting tissues? And we have to realize there are actually three categories. One would be rare diseases that can affect the cause of inflammatory periodontitis. Examples are papillon lefevre, leukocyte adhesion, deficiency, hypophosphatasia, and others. And many of these, um, even though they are rare, once they are there, they have a major impact and they result in early presentation of severe periodontitis already at young age. And then, of course, there are other common, more common diseases, conditions that also can directly affect or have an influence on the cause of periodontitis. Typical example here, diabetes mellitus. The magnitude of the effects on conditions um, is more variable, but overall they result in increased occurrence and severity of periodontitis. And finally, there are again mainly rare conditions that also have an effect, but independent of inflammation induced by the dental plaque biofilm. And examples for this third group are cancer, like squamous cell carcinoma, lung health, histiocytosis, and a few others. And they result in breakdown of periodontal tissues, and some may even mimic the clinical presentation of periodontitis. Uh, question three, um, should diabetes-associated periodontitis be a distinct diagnosis? Well, the answer, actually the consensus was that there are no characteristic phenotypic features unique to periodontitis in patients with diabetes mellitus. On this basis, diabetes-associated periodontitis is not a distinct disease. Nevertheless, diabetes is an important modifying factor of periodontitis. It should be included in a clinical diagnosis of periodontitis as a descriptor. And also under the new classification, as you've learned from Professor Mariano Sanz in his lecture, the level of glycemic control in diabetes influences the grading of periodontitis. Number four, should smoking associated periodontitis be a distinct diagnosis? Well, you have to realize tobacco smoking these days is recognized as a dependence to nicotine recognized as a chronic, relapsing, 
medical disorder. It's not just a behavioral factor. And it has severe health consequences, as we all know. Again, there are no unique periodontal phenotypic features of periodontitis in smokers. On this basis, smoking-associated periodontitis is not a distinct diagnosis. This was the consensus. Nevertheless, smoking is an important modifying factor, should be included in the clinical diagnosis as a descriptor. And when it comes to the grading, again, as we learned from Professor Mariano Sanz in his lecture, the level of tobacco use at the time of diagnosis would influence the grading of periodontitis. Okay, to summarize, um, we can come up with um, two categories in the end. For once, we have periodontitis as a direct manifestation of systemic disease. We do realize uh, systemic disorders with a major impact on loss of periodontal tissues by directly influencing periodontal information. And these should be classified actually uh, based on the primary systemic disease using the ICD-10 coding system. And these are genetic disorders. An example would be here diseases affecting or associated with immunological disorders like Papillon Lefebvre, diseases affecting the oral mucosa and gingival tissues like Epidemolysis bullosa, uh, diseases affecting connective tissues, ehlers danlos syndromes, for example, metabolic and endocrine disorders like hypophosphatasia. Then, of course, acquired immunodeficiency diseases like HIV infection, and finally, inflammatory diseases, for example, inflammatory bowel disease. And then, of course, we have the other systemic disorders that we talked about, influencing the pathogenesis like diabetes, like smoking, like the nicotine dependence, obesity would be another example here. And on the other hand, we do have systemic diseases or conditions that affect the periodontal supporting tissues independently of inflammatory periodontitis. An example here are neoplasms, we mentioned oral squamous cell carcinoma, and other disorders just like um, to mention Langerhals cell histiocytosis and those again should be classified based on the primary systemic disease using the ICD-10 coding system.